everyone, welcome to Jackie's Literary Corner. I am Jackie, and it's time for a book tag. So, this is my second autumnal book tag, and it is the Cozy Autumn book tag. Although it's Cozy Fall tag, but as I've said before, I kind of like the word autumn better. I, yeah, I like the sound of it better. So, you guys know the drill, and I have a series of questions, and, um... And here it goes. Okay, so question number one is, what is a book that reminds you of fall slash autumn? And I went with The Secret History by Donna Tartan. As you can see, I'm on my reread of it. I haven't got very far in it. I've taken a step back from it because it's October. Um, Um, and I chose this one because when I think of autumn or fall, I think of school, starting school. And this book takes place at a university in New Hampshire. I also think of, when I also think of autumn, I think of New England, the New England area, like Massachusetts, New York, New, um, Maine, all those places, because I just get the, that, I get that kind of autumnal feel in that area. And, you know, New Hampshire is in New England. In the New England part of the United States. Um, and this also is a bit of a, um, involves murder, someone getting murdered, although it's not really a murder mystery. It's about, because we know who committed the murder, it's more about the consequences of that murder and how our main character and his, the other characters deal with the situation. Um, and it's all like, and it's about these kids, they're in school, and they're pretentious and snobby and obsessed with Greek literature and with Greek, Greek culture and literature and stuff like that. So I definitely associate that with, um, you know, autumn, because that's usually, at least, that's, at least in the United States, that's when you start school, is the beginning of autumn. Um, and I did debate, it was either between this or If We Were Villains, which also has a similar idea. Except for Shakespeare, and it's a little shorter of a book, but it kind of, it has the same ideas in it. Someone gets murdered, and it's all, you know, it's about the consequences to that murder, and how our characters deal with it. Okay, so, question number... Question number two, what is your favorite autumnal book cover? And, oh, it says specifically, what's your favorite? Well, I was just kind of picking an autumnal book cover because I couldn't find, I couldn't figure out which of my books are autumnal. And as you guys know, I have the pages out so that when I finish the book, I can turn it around, show the spines, and it, that's kind of my reward as Holly from Holly Arts Books puts it, coloring your shelf. Um, so I really kind of just picked one that I thought had an autumnal cover, and I picked, you know, this one will work too. Okay, I'm going to show you guys two, because, um, well actually I'm going to show three. So yeah, apparently I have someone that could apply this answer, I think. Okay, and I'm going to go with... so you guys can see it. So hard. It's not as easy holding these like you holding cards. So I picked The Thirteenth Tale, um, East of Eden, if you can see it, and the, ha the Haunting of Hill House. Um, they have the same kind of color scheme as Autumn and uh, this one, East of Eden and Haunting of Hill House, of like woodsy areas. And it, so, and just, it's like, again, it feels very, like I said, it feels very autumnal with the haunted house and the woods and everything. The dead, the dead environment of the woods. And then this one, I associate books, especially, you know, books that look like this with, like, with autumn. I mean, I know you can read any time of year, and I read any time of year, and I, I'm a mood reader, I will read whatever I want any time of year. I'm not a seasonal reader. 
but there are certain books that do feel a little autumnal. In this cover, not just with the, the, the coloring, but also the books, it just, it just gives autumnal vibes, if that makes any sense. Next question is question number three. What is your favorite autumnal drink to read with? And I don't really, I don't do it that often, but a lot of times I will all ever all year, all hundred three hundred sixty five days a year I will drink coffee. Um, but I do like pumpkin spice latte, hot chocolate, um, and chai latte. I will, but I don't have a specific drink I will only drink when I'm reading, like, but there are obviously specific drinks that I will drink during the autumn time. Although with the way our weather here is in North Carolina, I am still drinking lemonade, and if it was a little chilly, I would not be drinking lemonade for, you know, I would lose it. But yeah, I like, like I said, hot chocolate, chai lattes, and pumpkin, and anything pumpkin flavored. Which I'm sure that most people probably have that as an answer. Okay, so question number four. Do you prefer to read late at night or early in the morning? I had difficulty with this question. Because oftentimes, even in the in autumn time, in the, even now, I will read um, like late morning. So it's not early in the morning, but I will also read in the evening, like early evening. And then I will read around midnight when I go to bed, when I at least physically get in bed. Not necessarily that I'm falling asleep. Well, actually, I am probably falling asleep at that point. But I try to get some reading, especially if I'm on my computer right up until that point, which is practically every night. Then, you know, because the whole, like, the light that, the ultraviolet light that comes from your computer can trick your brain. And sometimes... You end up thinking, oh, it's time to wake up. But, I mean, of course, if you're tired enough, then, yeah, you'll still manage to fall asleep. But that's why I always, like, read a book. Even if it's late, it's, like, midnight and almost 1 o'clock, I would still read at least a little bit for as long as I can keep my eyes open. That way, maybe I'll... I will guarantee that I'll go, to, I'll go to sleep. So, it's a tricky question because I don't ever read early in the morning because I like to get some breakfast first. I mean, if I get up super early before the sun is up, like for some reason if I wake up at like 6 or something and it's not because I have to go to work, then maybe if I'm having trouble falling asleep, maybe I'll read a little bit. But at least I read early, early, late morning, early afternoon, and then early evening. Well, I think certain books would benefit from reading late at night, especially this time of year. Like, horror books would probably benefit reading them late at night so you can scare the crap out of yourself. Um, so, and the, you can feel the atmosphere in the book, the intended atmosphere of the story. Like, you know, Jekyll and Hyde and then The, the Shining. I wasn't creeped out by those, you know? I mean, I would definitely be more creeped out by the on-screen adaptations, whether it's a TV show or movie, I just enjoyed the book, but it's not like I was, like, biting my nails or, like, shaking as I read it, but, um, but I feel, but I do think that there is a possibility that I would have benefited more from it if I had, if I was reading it in late at night or something, like, if I stayed up all night and reading them, although the other problem is I don't like staying up all night to read a book. If I'm very close to the end of the book, then maybe I will. But I just not, I, I just, I feel guilty about it, and I also feel weird when I'm, like, finally finished a book, and I'm so, I'm on a bit of a high kind of feeling after I finish a book, and then I can't fall asleep for a while, because I'm still kind of wired from reading the book, even if it's done. So, long story short, I guess, I, I mean, when I practiced this, my answers to this, and thought them over, I did say early in the morning because I will read most of the time in the late morning in the afternoon because then I feel like if you get up early enough or if you read even if you don't get up early enough and read late in late morning you still have the whole day ahead of you granted if 
granted, maybe I'm the only weird reading reader weirdo that, you know, will like to do other stuff that is not necessarily stuff that I have to do. Not just, you know, read books, because there are people that will read 24 hours or read most of the day, and I, for as much as, as much as I love reading, I'm passionate about reading, I just can't. I always, you know, I want to watch TV or watch YouTube videos or mostly booktube videos. And then sometimes, and then of course I gotta eat and I'm not gonna miss a meal with my family. You know, I mean, sometimes I do. But, so I like to do other stuff. So it's like reading in the morning allows the opportunity to do other stuff later on in the day. So again, long story short, I guess early in the morning. I think so. Question number seven. I'm kind of thinking about my posture. I'm wanting to make sure I have a good posture. It's so easy to like not have good posture and get lazy about it. But I don't want to be one of those older people that has a bit of a hunch right here. You know, I mean, granted, there are, I believe there are some people that the way they're built, they can't help it. I mean, I have relatives that older relatives that can't help and I mean my mom says because it's in my dad's family he could potentially get to that point and not have and can't help but have a hunch so I'm just but it's just so easy to get lazy and not think about it and it also gets annoying when you have your your mom or your grandma pushing on your back and telling you stand up straight like I would not want to live with someone who was a military man and was constantly correcting my posture because that would get really old and I would purposely slump Although, you know, or like, uh, although I find it, I was kind of funny that scene in the first Princess Diaries where the gram, where Clarice is trying to teach Mia how to walk properly and have an upright posture because she's a princess and she'll be queen someday. So she has to act like a lady and act proper and that includes good, having good posture. And, you know, Mia's walking back and forth and her, Clarice is like, you know, yo, you stand up straight, you gotta, so we don't slump slump, you know, walk, and she looked like she was walking around like an orangutan and she demonstrated how Mia was walking and then Mia did an exaggerated long stride kind of walk right after her. Oh, that was funny. Anyway, let's get back to the tag. Okay, so question number five. Halloween is coming, which is why I decided to do this tag now because of question number five, although I think you can do this tag in November too, but you know, you might want to skip this question or rephrase it a little bit, you know. Instead of saying Halloween is coming, you know, Halloween has passed in life, so what's your favorite spooky book? So I guess you could just rephrase it if you decide to do this later. This is just the one question. Um, what is your favorite spooky book? Oh, I forgot my answer. I forgot I should have taken down my answer for that book. Let's see what I find that book. Um... Well, now that I see it, it's a, it's a weird size book. That's why I have a copy of it. Um, so where is it? Other question? Um, I'll know it when I see it because, like I said, it has an odd. Which one did I say? and I don't want to waste your guys' time. So, the book that I was going to... Ugh, damn it. You guys disappeared on me for a second. Um, I don't want to waste your guys' time, so I'm not going to bother to show it to you, but It by Stephen King is my favorite spooky book. It's been my favorite. It still is my favorite Stephen King, although it's tied with The Shining now. Um, But it has... It really looks... You know, it scares like it looks at your most vulnerable time in your life and you get scared the most easily 
and there's a lot of creepy, freaky scenes, and it's psychological horror, which is one of my, my kind of horror. Either that or supernatural horror. Like, I love, like, those are my two favorite types of horror. In fact, they were probably the only horror I would really watch religiously. Um, but just, it gets you in the most vulnerable place, the most personal place, because it's all about childhood and comparing, you know, how you were most vulnerable and eat more easily scared as a kid. And plus, clowns scare the crap out of me. I think they're really creepy. And yep, I'm one of those weirdos, who, one of those people who find clowns absolutely terrifying. Um, so yeah, I would show you it, but I totally forgot to grab it. I should have grabbed it before I started filming, but I totally forgot about that one. I was mostly focusing on the last question in my and make sure the books to show you for the last one. Okay, so question number six. What is the ultimate comfort read for you? And I said I went here with Dickens for a comfort read. Most people find comfort in ro fluffy romances. I find comfort in reading classics like Dickens, his work. And there's just something about him, like, like with romance, I feel like most of the time you're guaranteed a happy ending, um, although this particular book, I feel like, is a little bit more of a bittersweet ending. Um, but you're always guaranteed a happy ending, and her, his books are wholesome and warm and give me warm and fuzzy feelings when I read the soap, or what I've read of him so far. And... You know, like there's, like I said, there's a pretty good chance they're gonna end happy, even if the characters are miserable for quite throughout most of the book. Like Oliver Twist, that kid Oliver goes through so much crap. But like I said, with you know, but he still gets a happy ending. So these books are just like I feel like the Dickens, with a few exceptions. And granted, I haven't read all of his works, and this is the only one I know for sure that it's not one one hundred percent a happy ending. But, um, you always, you, I feel like there's a good chance that, like it said, most of them are going to end up happy. And they're just fun and exaggerated and sometimes silly stories. And it's just, it's, I, you know, it makes me feel good when I read his books. Okay, so next question number seven is... What is your favorite autumnal reading snack? And like with drinks, I don't snack that often when I'm reading my books because then I'll get crumbs in the books. And then sometimes I feel like, depending on the snack I'm eating, sometimes I have to stop what I'm reading and focus on what my snack. And sometimes, you know, when you're reading, when you're eating something, sometimes you neglect what you're reading, or you neglect, or you focus so much on the book. That you neglect the food you're eating, even if it's like finger food. Um. So I really don't have an answer for this one. I mean, I will probably eat the same the same snacks as I would, you know, any time of year or any time of day when I'm snacking. You know, Cheez Its, those on the pretzel pillow pretzels that they're pretzels with stuffed with um, peanut butter that we get at my at Harris Teeter. Or they're, they have the ones that are stuffed with brownies that a lot of people like. I personally, I don't know, I just don't like the mixture of the salt and the, the sweet. The, the salty and the sweet. I, I'm not a big fan of that. So, um, and then, you know, our cookies, like, crisp, you know, holiday cookies or something, you know, or candy. So I don't really have a specific snack that I will, you know. Okay, so... Question number eight. What is your favorite autumnal candle to burn while reading? And I do not do that. I don't burn candles. First of all, I live at home, so my mom is terrified I'm going to burn down the house if I burn down candles. And I can never light a candle or blow it out. And a lot of times, for some reason, like every time I, my birthday, when, you know, we do candles and stuff, I always... It takes me forever because first of all, I'm really giddy, so I'm giggly, or I'm like spitting on the candle, you know. And a lot of times, and I'm probably giddy and giggly because my parents are making fun of me because I cannot blow on a dang on candle. 
Um, so, yeah, my parents don't want me to, you know, have candles in here. That's the, that's the, the kind of, I am, before anyone reminds me, I am, I know how lucky I am, how privileged I am to live at home with my parents. And they do a lot for me. They give me, since I cannot drive, they give me rides to work and pick me up. Or they give me rides to, if I want to go to Books a Million or something. Um, and all I have to do is give them, you know, write them a check for a certain amount of money as a, you know, a, as a kind of a rent. So I know before, like I said, before anyone says anything, I am well aware of how privileged and lucky I am. But with that being said, there are some downsides to living at home. Like, I'm still kind of under their rules. So, like, my, you know, and, but they're, you know, so, but at the same time, they're little things. Like, my mom would rather I not have food or drink up here because she doesn't want me to spill on the carpet. Even though I would be the, you know, because sometimes, sometimes I don't know how to clean up certain messes anyway because I'm just, I've never really taken care of myself completely. So, and I've never taken care of my own space. Like, I'll ha I have a room, but I don't, and also, like, and then, like I said, she won't let me burn candles. So, but, so they're also, and again, I'll say this as well, that they're little things. So they're, they're minor problems. They're minor annoyances. But, you know, it's, so it's not a big enough deal for me to, you know, want to give up the fact that I live at home. I mean, in fact, I'm terrified to live on my own just as much as I'm terrified to, if I ever could, drive. Because there's a lot of crazy on the road, people on the road, and you have to rely on, depend on other people. So they're just little things that are kind of annoying, but at the end of the day, you know, I can, I get past it. Like, at the end of the day, I'm, you know, I'm cool with living at home and living under my parents' roof and following their rules. I mean, not completely, but... <laughs> So it's it's not that big of a deal, but yeah, there it's it can be a little annoying at times. Well, so again, I say that I know how lucky I am. <laughs> I feel like sometimes you have to tell, you have to repeat something to people and be like, "I'm well aware of this." And you have to you know have to remind people yes before because even if you say, I feel like sometimes they'll still jump on you and be like, "How dare you think that way? You don't know how lucky you are." Um, but anyway, getting off topic, again, as always, okay, so that was, so yeah, I don't burn candles, although, I guess if I did burn candles, I like, I would like pumpkin spice smell, pumpkin spice smell, really, um, maybe a woodsy smell would be kind of nice too around this time of year, um, maybe the smell of, you know, crackling fire, and, you know, these could also go into winter reading burning candles too or maybe even the smell of like parchment and books and stuff again that can also talk to winter burning candles in the winter time as well um or cinnamon like i feel like there's a lot of autumnal smells that can blur with winter smells too okay or at least the transition okay question number where am i question number Okay, question number nine is what, when you're not reading, what is your favorite autumnal activity? Well, of course, when I was a kid, I liked dressing up and going and getting and going trick-or-treating to get the candy, going trick-or-treating with my friends. As I get a little bit older, I liked going to the Charles County Fair where, you know, we used to live in Maryland and that was so much fun. The atmosphere of the fair, the stuffed ham, the funnel cake, seeing all the crafts, you know, there was, we had, a you know, a craft tent or, or a barn where there was all these crafts and stuff and all the things that people made and all the little you know things that they would sell and going to looking at the all the things like the old-fashioned stuff like looking at the the school the old schoolhouse and they would have like props and stuff um looking at all the cute adorable animals and of course that always stunk always smelled horrible because it always smelled like the crap that they would that would come out of their butts and but this and the smell in the air not just the food but there's something and yes it was probably mixed with crap like literal crap as in poop the poop smell but there was also something 
another kind of smell that I would get in the air when I would go to the, the Charles County Fairgrounds and going to the rides with my friends, although I stopped doing that after a while. And then when, um, you know, my sister was part of a group of kids that performed and stuff, and sometimes they would get the chance to perform on stage at the Charles County Fair. And it was, there was always, and I always look forward to that every year. I mean, we had, now we have, since we moved to North Carolina, we've only been to the fair once, but not the North Carolina Fair. We went to the South Carolina Fair, and that's okay. It was a little different. It was fun. It still gave me nostalgia feels, even though it wasn't, you know, Maryland's fair. And, um, now that I'm a little, as I've gotten older, I really like watching scary movies or spooky movies or autumnal movies, you know, like, and I like figuring out which ones I would associate with this time of year. And, like, I would spend, and then... 31 Nights of Halloween was always so fun. They would show Adam's Family. They would show some of the, now they show some of the Disney movies on there. And all the, um, like even some of the Disney Channel original movies now are on Freeform. What is now known as Freeform. But I think it's because they kind of have a tie to each other. Like Disney owns Freeform, I believe. Because, I mean, the one of the first changes was ABC Family. Before, it, the first, I originally, it was Fox Family, then it became ABC Family, and ABC Family is owned by Disney. And now it's Freeform, so. So I guess it's kind of a sub, uh, I can't think of the word. It's, like, connected to Disney, so they can, I think they can get away with showing, like, Disney-related stuff, like Disney Channel, some of the spooky Disney Channel original movies, and at least the most popular ones. Um, so all the specials, like the Toy Story and Shrek special. Um, and it's just, like, in Hocus Pocus... It will replay several times. I think it's going to be, according to an article I read last night, I think it's going to be playing 14 times this year. And I try to watch my copy of it before I watch it on TV, but there are so many times when I'm, like, eating dinner and I have the house to myself so I can watch what I want to watch. And, you know, I will put it on 31 Nights of Halloween. And then, of course, the next thing is 25 Days of Christmas on that channel. And then now, because I'm too old for trick-or-treating, and I don't go to Halloween parties, because there's no Halloween parties nearby, and I'm not, like, a teenager anymore. I go to, I have gone to the last couple of years, I've decided to hang out with my parents and pass out candy, which is really, you know, to the little kids and stuff. And I decide I'm going to draw, if that happens, because, you know, the pandemic is still going on, so I don't know if they're going to let kids trick-or-treat, go trick-or-treating. But I would, you know, I'm going to do, like, I'm going to dress up in my Daenerys Targaryen cosplay and have a dragon. Now, unfortunately, the kids are not, my mom reminded me, the kids probably won't know, but the parents and adults will know who I'm dressed up as. But I figured the kids will know what a dragon is. So now I'm going to have a dragon. But yeah, the parents are not going to let watch kids, you know, under 10 or maybe under, like, 16 watch Game of Thrones. Um, but dude, I'm wearing an under I'm wearing a shirt under this one, and it's like it's one of those stretchy shirts that it still bunches up a little bit at the bottom. Just okay. So there's a lot of okay. So the last question is, what is your autumnal fall reading list? And I picked out a couple books I. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna do, just gonna, I'm not gonna hold it up or anything, I'll like hold the stack up. I'm just gonna pre present it to you guys one at a time. So, A Tale of Two Cities, this is a reread. It's about the um, French Revolution, and the two cities are London and, and Paris. Um, and this one I read back in one of my, my college literature classes. And I remember it being one of my favorites. But I'm going to read it again. See if it's still a favorite. And it very well could have been influenced by, by you know, was my first Dickens. I'm also, I'm go ahead and say my other Dickens book, Bleak House. I don't know if I'm finishing it because this sucker is 800 pages. At least this edition of it. Um, what's that? 
I don't know what that is. I think it's coming off of the book. But as you can see, I'm, I think this is chapter 20, I want to say. I think I'm on chapter 20 right now. I can never read no Roman numerals. Um, but I'm not going to, it's just hard to, it won't take too long for me to explain it, um, explain this one to you, but I think it involves a will, you know, who has the rights to the, what's on the will, you know, this, and then, like, I think it's kind of a similar plot to Our Mutual Friend, which I'm going by Keeney from Books and Things' description of that plot, and then we have a girl, Esther, who was, you know, she's in an, um, and it's all about finding out who her mom is, and she might be connected to one of the characters. Um, so that's a really poor summary, but as usual, Dickens, don't have a lunar plot. Okay, I also picture Dorian Graham and can fin continue, I just finished reading The Dark Monk. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of Victorian literature. Um, and since Victober, I kind of now, when I think of Victorian literature, I think of this time of year. Um, although, you know, I'm not above reading, I will, you know, I will read books any time of year if I'm in the mood for them. This, basically, this pretty boy, he's getting his portrait painted, um, and he's told that beauty really matters and that he's going to lose his beauty one day and he's not going to be as good looking anymore. So he, the drama queen that he is, makes a deal with the devil, so to speak, so that his the portrait will age, but he won't. And the portrait reflects all his sins and all the bad stuff he's done, and you know, throughout the rest of the story. Okay. Um. And I think, like I said, I think with this, I feel like I read this is another this is another reread. And I feel like this one I will like better now. So far, I am liking this better now. I love the writing. And I think I read it during the time when I felt like I should read something like this. And I was thinking, oh, it's not that long. And I read this with my friend Therese. And my, be my best one of my best friends, Therese, we read it together for a book club. And I barely remember the book. I mean, I remember the basic premise, obviously. But at that time... I just, I felt like I couldn't appreciate that and I was only reading it because, like, I felt like I had to. Like, I felt like it was a book that I should be reading. But now that I've had more experience, more experience with Victorian literature and classics, I'm trying this again, and so far I am really enjoying it. Next is another one that I read a long time ago and I feel like I will enjoy it better now than I did the first time I attempted to read and that is Dracula. This is another autumnal read because, well, it's a horror book about a vampire, about one of the most famous vampires. Like, there's two really famous vampires in in fiction, and that's Nosferatu, and then, oh, I got it right! I think I said it right that time. Nosferatu. Um, the guy in the vampire in the 1922 movie, I think it was 24, or it might have been 24. But this came first. Dracula, the book, came first. But Nosferatu... The book, the movie, it's not a book, the movie, um, or, okay, scratch that, erase, start over, um, so Nosferatu came out in the 20s, this, the, this book came first, before Nosferatu, and then they made a movie of this, after, I think, after Nosferatu. Actually, no, they might have been, there might have been some movies before. Um, actually, no, I don't think, I, I don't know. But I think the adaptations of the book, of this book, didn't come out until after Nosferatu, I think. I'm not 100% sure on that. 100% sure on that. Maybe someone can correct me on the notes below, or I can look it up. Anyway, it's poor, about a vampire. <laughs> and, um... And I'm going to reread it, and I feel like I will like it better now. And I like the look of this book. I, I don't know. I love the feeling of these kinds of books with the engraved quotes from the from the novel. And um, I like this type this font or typography or whatever you want to call it. I don't know if type typography and font are the same thing. I'll have to look that up. And 
and just the feel, the, the leather, velvet kind of feel of this book. I just, I love it. I almost got a, like, either Vintage to Classics or English Library Classics edition of this, but then I saw this one and I decided to grab it because I want another one of this edition because I have Age of Innocence in this edition. So I wanted to get another book in this kind of edition, so. And then, so I think it was Katie from Books and Things, or maybe it was Claudia from... Now I, I forgot her channel name again. Um, I remember her first name, but one of them, one of the classics, or Kate from Kate Howe, or one of the one of those booktubers that reads classics, talked about how this one is very autumnal, because it's all about this woman who inherits a farm, and it's all about her, you know, preserving that farm and growing things. So the idea of harvesting plant harvesting, you know, vegetables, it kind of has the tumble feel to it. I don't know, I think it was Katie from Books and Things who talked about it, so I, I decided to grab that this was the one I grabbed earlier at the last minute. The cover, I like this little silhouette of our main character Bathsheba. Um, and there is a bit of a love square because there she's got quite a few guys being for her affections. I think Three guys, a soldier, a charming soldier, a farmer, you know, and then I don't remember who the third guy, I don't remember who the third guy is, but I have seen bits and pieces of the movie starring, um, what's her, her name from An Education? Um, what's her name? She's done a lot lately. I can't remember her name. I think that's what the movie's called because there are a couple, there's, I know there's quite a few books and movies called Education. Like there is, um, but I think it's called an Education. It's about this girl who gets involved with an older married man. Um, and the actress in the adaptation of this, the most recent adaptation, because I think there was another adaptation before. But I cannot remember her name. I can picture her. But I've seen bits and pieces of that adaptation. Um, so I know a little bit of, you know, so I remember the premise even before I watched, like, booktubers talking about it. But, yeah, so I decided to put that one. And I, I wonder, I, I'm thinking about reading this, but I've, at the moment, I feel like this is going to be a favorite, the only Harney that I absolutely love, I think. Um, especially because Harney's... I hear that Ari is very depressing. His books are very depressing. I mean, I, the only thing that holds me back from loving Jude the Obscure is how horrifying the climax is and how depressing it is. And let's just say it involves children. And I, that was just too traumatic for me as an aunt of three toddlers. <laughs> um, but this is the one that has the most happy ending. So I wait, I don't know if I might want to read the um, Return of the Native first. Before I get to this one, because I like to save for the ones I'm most excited about, and what are the ones I think I most will, I will most enjoy. So I don't know. Um, and then you already seen this, but the Haunted Up Hill House is on there as well. It's a haunted house. It's based on like the Netflix show is based loosely on this. I hear very loosely. And then there was a movie. That came out a couple years ago, late '90s, I believe, with Catherine Zeta-Jones, Liam Neeson. Um, I can't remember the main actress. She was the actress from Mystic Pizza and The Conjuring, the first Conjuring movie that ever came out. <laughs> um, the woman who gets possessed. I can't. Remember. She was in The Haunting, the movie. Um, so I want to read this one. It's a short book. So, but I need to read one more, another Victorian literature before that. And then, there's that one. Okay, let me go ahead and show you one that I wanted that will, that fits in October, that I want to try to get in before the end of the month, or at least start it by the end of October. Um, and that is Serpent and Dub, which is a, um, the first book in, I believe it's going to be a trilogy I don't have honey, Blood and Honey yet, but I figure now is a good time since Blood and Honey is out. 
So that's where I like to get into the habit of doing when a book's going to become a series um, or a duology or a trilogy or whatever is get the next, don't read the first book until the next book comes out. Because I've done that too many times. Like, I I read and enjoyed, I was one of the few people who actually enjoyed um, King of Scars. But the second book has not written yet. Now, it's also partly the, I think it's partly because of the pandemic. And sometimes there are some people who just probably cannot focus during this, this horrible time in our, in our world. But, like I said, she hasn't, the second book has not come out yet. And I'm, you know, and the same thing with, I read Wicked Saints. And, what was the other one? There was another one I read this year that the sequel's coming out soon, or is out. Oh, The Gilded Wolves. And I love them both those first books. But the in, my interest in them is kind of waning. I mean, I still want to read the sequels to, both of, to all those books. But especially with King of Scars, I loved King of Scars, but at the same time it's like, okay, um, you know, I'm starting to move on from it, from the Grishaverse. <sighs> but anyway... So, Honey, Blood and Honey is the second book, and that's out now, I think. So, um, so this is the first book about, uh, it's kind of, I think it's a called, it's not kind of an alternate history, in Fr alternate history type story. It takes place in France, and our main character, we have two main characters, a witch who, is, who has fleed her coven, and due to circumstances, she is forced to marry a witch hunter, but he doesn't know she's a witch. So I think there's going to be a lot. It's kind of, you know, it, I'm a little nervous because I think it is kind of one of those books that, you know, it's very um, paranormal romance type story. And I don't know how I feel about those because I don't, romance focused stories aren't my thing. Like I will read some of them and I don't hate romance, but I'm not always, it's not my go-to type genre. You know, um, I do like this type of romance, but I still want to read it because it's about witches. And I've always been a sucker for witches. I mean, one of my first adult fantasy shows was Charmed. That was my favorite, was Charmed. The original, not the new one, although I love the new one too. I know a lot of people have a problem with the new one, even the actors themselves that weren't involved in the original show. Although I think the guy, you know, um, and in fact, as much, you know, I think, I don't know if they're going to actually ever be involved in it. I mean, the creators want to bring some of the original cast to make a guest appearance, but I think they're, none of them are really interested. I think the only person who might be interested is, in, is Rose McGowan, which is fine by me. I like Rose McGowan, you know. So, just as long as some of them. And I know, like, I know Brian Krause, even though he probably, you know, I think he would be loyal to Holly and Alyssa about the, you know, and probably also do not appreciate how the the producers treated them. But anyway, uh, we could get back to I only bring that because this is a book about witches. But anyway, so yeah, I picked. So yeah, I feel like this is another one that I want to read in October, preferably. At least by the end of the month, even if I go into November, because I don't feel like it's probably not as. Okay, so the last three books that I picked, you've already seen. Okay, so Secret History by Nanatar. I wanted to finish rereading it, but it's going to take me a while, just like I did the first time. And then, um, East of Eden, I, I want to finally finish it, but I don't know if it will happen. But I'm going to get back into it in November. Um... And I need to get past this current part that I'm on because I stopped it up this part last time, so I need to get past it. But this is a classic. It's kind of a Book of Genesis retelling. And, um, like I said, I'm on the same, I think I'm on the same part I stopped at last time, so this time I'm gonna get past that part. <laughs> And then the last book I want to show you guys that I feel like is a very autumnal is The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Sutterfield. I wanted to read, I want to read 
I want to, I've been meaning to reread this one, and I want to reread this one before I start, yeah, that was the other one I wanted to show you guys, I totally forgot to grab that one, um, Once Upon a River is another one I want to read in the lot, I want to read this year, but I might not get into one until winter, so that might be a winter read, I totally forgot that I, I put it on this, on my document to, when practicing this, this tag, but I wanted to reread this. I wanted to reread this before I started Once Upon a River because even though it's not a sequel, like with um, The Starless Sea, I wanted to read The Night Circus first before I started reading. Um, before I read the author's sophomore novel, and I so and I had that's another one I wanted to reread as well. And I don't have Bellman and Black. I ended up donating. I, I did like that one, but it's not my favorite. I still prefer this one over Bellman and Black. It's still a beautifully written story, a very interesting story. Um, but I prefer this one, and I want to reread this one, and I wanted to reread it. So I and I want to read it before I start Once Upon a River. I although I did start Once Upon a River a while back. So I'm, but I might start over because it's not like I got very far in it when I do start it. But this is basically about, um, this woman, I don't know if she's a journalist. Oh, she's a biographer. And, um, she's, like, not very experienced, but she is called to write the, she's summoned to write the biography for the famous author Vina Winter, who is very reclusive, she has wrote a series of fairy tales, and there was always that myth of the 13th tale that she was meant to publish but never did, and she never tells anyone her true story, the story of her life, her true life, and she wants to tell this woman uh, her actual true story, because every time people, reporters have asked her, she will always make up and come up with this a story because I mean she's an author so she's good at coming up with stories so she will come up with make up a story about her life and finally she wants to come out and tell her true story and I think it's probably something to do with like she's she knows that she's dying I'm not 100% sure on that because it's been a while but I think she's Vita Winter the author is pretty pretty old at this point oh and this one actually had an excerpt from Bellman and Black on here Okay, so that is the Cozy Autumnal or Fall book tag. If you guys are interested, feel free to do this. Consider yourself tagged. I hope you are keeping safe and you're reading to your heart's content. Unless you don't feel like it, don't feel pressure to read. And I will, I will talk to you all later. All right, bye.